Hi, and welcome to the webinar, What Black Women Need to Know About Cervical Cancer. I'm Asia McClellan, the Cervical Cancer Program Coordinator at SHARE. Please share in the chat where you're joining from us today. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SHARE. SHARE is a national nonprofit that supports, educates, and empowers anyone who's been diagnosed with women's cancers and provides outreach to the general public about signs, symptoms, because no one should have to face breast, ovarian, uterine, cervical, or metastatic breast cancer alone. For more information about upcoming webinars, support groups, and our helplines, please visit sharecancersupport.org. All participants will be muted during the presentation. Once Dr. David West finishes presenting, we'll begin the Q&A discussion. Feel free to comment in the chat. You can also use the chat or Q&A section at the bottom of your screen to ask the presenter a question. Please remember that Dr. David West is unable to give specific medical advice, so keep your questions general in nature. We also have closed captioning available. You can enable this feature by clicking the live transcript button on the bottom of the screen and selecting the subtitle option. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the SHARE website soon. I will now hand it over to today's speaker to introduce herself. Thank you, Aisha, so much. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I'm very excited to be participating here with SHARE on this very, very important topic, uh, what Black women need to know about cervix cancer. I am a gynecologic oncologist with Northwell Health in New York. I am located in the Westchester region of our health system. Um, you can read about me on this page, and then we can hopefully get started with, our pres with my presentation. Um, seeing that we have a good bit to talk about and cover. So I'd like to uh, get through all my slides and give everybody an opportunity to ask questions if they have any. Okay, so uh, here is the presentation, what black women need to know about cervix cancer. So as most of you know, um, this month is cervix cancer awareness month or cervical health month. And so we're ending the month on this high note discussing this very important topic. Uh, I just wanna dedicate this presentation to um, my patients past and present with precancers um, and cancers of the cervix. Let's see, sorry, give me a second. Okay. So just some objectives as we start the talk. Um, we're gonna go through just a brief overview of the impact of cervical cancer nationally, globally, and on diverse groups. Uh, and then uh, I'll, we'll delve into HPV, the human papillomavirus, and how it relates to cervix cancer. Uh, we'll talk a lot about this throughout the, throughout the conversation. Then we'll go into screening for cervical cancer and the natural history of the disease, and that's where I'll delve into diagnosis and treatment strategies for this disease. And then of course, we'll um, highlight prevention of cervical cancer. Uh, so just so we all know what we're talking about, we have some anatomical representation here. This is our uterus. The cervix is the bottom part of the uterus connected to the vagina. And this is just a pictorial of if a cervix cancer was visualized on the cervix, what it would look like. Um, and so- um, Sorry to interrupt. We can't see your slides, Dr. David. Oh, really? Oh, oh my gosh. I'm sorry. Hold on. <laughs> it's I'm okay. Like, you know what? I think, um, uh, let's see. You know, I was having an issue with, oh, here we go. Oh, let me. Okay. I apologize. I think I, there we go. <laughs> okay. We can see them. Okay, good. Um, so this is my dedication page and we'll continue on. All right, so this is the objectives that I verbally described. And here is the pictorial that I was mentioning. Um, for just anatomical perspective, we have the uterus and cervix here. Um, the cervix is the lower part of the, the uterus connected to the vagina. And then this is just a pictorial of what a cervix cancer would look like an early stage lesion if we saw it on exam. And so this is what the cervix looks like when we put that speculum in the vagina. <clears throat> so whenever I 
do presentations, I like to kind of give highlight a case or describe a case scenario. And I think we can't you can't talk about cervix cancer without mentioning a very, very important figure in cervix cancer history. So some of you may know this picture. Some of you may know who this woman is um, or was. Um, her name is Henrietta Lacks, and uh, she is a woman who was diagnosed with cervix cancer in the 1950s. If this, does, if this picture doesn't look familiar, maybe the, this book cover looks familiar. Uh, it was a number one New York Times bestseller published uh, several years ago, uh, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. And why is she so important? Uh, why do we have a book about her and why should we remember her and know her this month and every month is because she, when she was diagnosed with cervix cancer in the 1950s, she unfortunately had an advanced stage and uh, due to lack of uh, access to care given in the 50s where limited access to black people um, in the part of the country she was in. Uh, she did not get the care that she needed in a timely fashion aspects, um, of course, contributing to fear, lack of um, insurance or lack of accessibility or long wait times for clinics. Um, and so when she was diagnosed, she was in, in an advanced stage and the cells that were taken from her cervix for biopsy to prove her cancer ended up um, becoming known as HeLa cells, which are the first immortalized human cell line um, in our in research today. And these HeLa cells have been involved in key medical discoveries, such as polio vaccine, various cancer drugs, in vitro fertilization, and even our most recent COVID-19 vaccine. And uh, uh, not only do these um, HeLa cells pave the way for future discoveries, they also pave the way for improved ethics and consent for human subject research. Um, because in her case, the cells were taken without her consent. And so this, um, uh, this practice obviously has changed over time and she has been immortalized not only in these cells, but in the work that her family is doing on her behalf and on the behalf of all patients who um, are invited to um, be involved in human subject research. So I just wanted to highlight her case and emphasize um, uh, her role in, in the history of cervix cancer. Uh, so general statistics on cervix cancer, um, it is really, it's a global issue when we think about it. It's the fourth most, fourth most common cancer worldwide. It ranks after breast, colorectal, and lung cancers. Here in the United States, about 0.7% of all new cancers will be a cervix cancer. And in 2022, uh, we had about 14,000 new cases of cervix cancer and about a little over 4,000 deaths. Uh, the numbers for 2023 that... Um, are being projected or similar, we're maybe just below 14,000 and it's still around that 4,000 um, uh, mark. And this graph is um, a little dated information, but you can see that the incidence has slowly declined over time, um, but the death rate is kind of stabilizing and leveling out. And uh, this is obviously more work is being done and we're trying to eradicate this disease. As I mentioned, it's a global impact. Um, we see this um, cancer all over the world. And in 2018, the data showed that there are uh, over um, 570,000 new cases of cervix cancer and then over 300,000 deaths. These pictorials here show us the darker colors are the highest incidence in blue and the darker reds are the um, highest mortality rates. And you can see they're centralized primarily in Africa. Um, and then China and India together contribute to burden a third of these um, cervix cancer burden that we're seeing worldwide. Um, and so when we look at this and we have to think about what is driving this, why are we seeing this globally and affecting these particular countries? And so, you know, I did a review with some of my colleagues a couple of years ago, looking at the incidence and disparities in cervix cancer. And what we found globally in developing countries was that the factors deriving this disparity were higher rates of infectious agents, human papillomavirus, hepatitis, HIV, decreased structural and financial resources for screening programs, um, individuals with poor socioeconomic status, and then individuals in rural communities. When we looked at the disparity in the United States, we said, well, what's driving our disparity? Because we're seeing that same disparity here. What is the driving force? And so we found within our walls, it is our uninsured or immigrant uh, populations and then the uh, populations with low education. 
Uh, also, we saw individual with, individuals with poor socioeconomic status and individuals living in rural communities. And when we delve deeper into that rural community aspect, we look at the Southern states where we see most of these rural communities. And this is where we're seeing our highest incidence of cervix cancer. Uh, the incidence rate of newly diagnosed cervix cancer is 8.5 per 100,000. And it has the highest death rate at 2.7 per 100,000. Um, and so when we look at the global impact in here in the United States, the similarities that we're seeing are this poor socioeconomic status is rural communities. These are, um, uh, these are consistent in the developing world and here. And what's different is in the developing countries, they, have, they don't have the same resources we have um, for screening. They don't have the financial support, but we do. And unfortunately, we're still seeing these disparities in these populations. Um, furthermore, you can see that um, um, the number of new cases and deaths will differ by race. Um, adding to the disparity that we're seeing and uh, compared to the, our white counterparts, uh, we see black and Latinx um, new cases and deaths, death rates are higher at, at nine and three per 100,000 and 10 and 2.5. And then of course, as well as our American Indian and Alaskan natives are also at a high um, um, incidence and death rates compared to our white and our Asian counterparts. Um, and so, when we think about all of this, as I mentioned, we have these um, disparities that we're seeing and what's driving them is again, as I mentioned, the various aspects, but then really what's leading to the rising numbers is the lack of screening or the lack of prevention. And I'm going to talk a lot about um, screening with the pap smear and HPV testing or the pap test as some may know it, and also talk about prevention with the human papillomavirus um, vaccine, which is available um, worldwide at this point. And so we'll start off with looking at risk factors for cervix cancer as we delve into how can we um, screen for this disease and how can we prevent it. And so risk factors, I've mentioned it a lot now, so clearly it's a big deal, human papillomavirus. So it's 90 to 100% of cases of cervix cancer will be related to HPV. HPV has various strains and I'll mention it, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but it's the high risk strains that are most um, concerning. They're the ones that are most closely associated with cervix cancer and they're the ones that are harder to clear and they were the ones that persist. Abnormal pap smears or pap test is a risk factor. And this is a patient, let's say, who has an abnormal pap smear and just never has a follow-up, never sees another GYN for several years, maybe loses their insurance. Maybe they now are in a rural community where they have limited access. This is the patient or person who's at high risk for cervix cancer. Immunodeficiency syndromes or illnesses that compromise your immune system um, will put you at higher risk. Early age of intercourse, put you at higher risk because of that exposure to HPV. HPV is a sexually transmitted virus. And so 80% uh, of men and women who are sexually active will, trans will have HPV and will share this virus. Multiple lifetime sex partners, again, has, um, will then increase your exposure to HPV. Smoking is a big risk factor. There's lots of data that shows direct correlation with smoking and cervix cancer, and also with smoking and persistence of the pre-cancer or pre-invasive lesions on the cervix that will turn into cancer. And then again, including our disparity in the low socioeconomic status groups. Symptoms of cervix cancer. Uh, this is a nice pictorial that I like to share uh, just because it gives its uh, it has a nice diagrams and just, um, clear clear indications of what you'd be looking for. But we have to remember that these symptoms will most likely be in a patient with an advanced stage of cervix cancer. Early stage cervix cancer is usually without symptoms. Um, the patients with early stage cervix cancer are those patients who will be diagnosed through the algorithms that we use for um, after a, an abnormal pap smear is diagnosed. Uh, so they'll go on to have a biopsy with what's called a colposcope or using colposcopy, um, and then um, go on to have a cancer diagnosis or, or other. Uh, but the symptoms that we wanna think about and pay attention to 
are the unusual vaginal discharge or malodorous smelly discharge, abnormal vaginal bleeding. This can be either heavy or longer periods or bleeding between periods or bleeding with intercourse, um, discomfort or pain with urinating, uh, problems with bowel movements, change in bladder function, uh, pain with intercourse, just generalized pelvic pain, leg pain, unexplained weight loss. Of course, each of these symptoms individually doesn't mean you have cervix cancer, but a constellation of these symptoms and in the right setting and the right patient could definitely be warning signs. Diagnosis and treatment of cervix cancer. So it's all it starts with tissue biopsy. It's so important to have that tissue diagnosis. You can't confirm a cancer diagnosis without a pathologist looking at that tissue and confirming, yes, there are cancer cells here. So once we have that tissue diagnosis, we then go on to imaging to evaluate the extent of the disease. We use a variety of imaging modalities, such as a CT scan, MRI, PET CT scan. The two most um, common scans we will use are the PET CT scan and MRI. These give us much more detailed information about the extent of the cancer. MRI will give us tissue characterizations around and at the cervix level uh, to determine local extent of disease. And then the PET CT scan injects a special sugar-based dye that will then uh, let us know if the cancer is localized or if it has spread to other sites such as lymph nodes or other organs. Treatment, there are a variety of treatment options we have, and I'll highlight these towards the end of the talk as with radical surgery for early stage disease um, or simple um, non-radical surgery, depending on the extent of disease. And then there's chemotherapy with radiation and immunotherapy that we do offer for our advanced stage disease. Prevention is really what I'll highlight for the most of the talk moving forward. Uh, and I want to stress that because this cancer, cervix cancer, is the only GYN cancer with an effective screening tool for the general population. Um, the pap smear pap test, it's a low risk, easy to do test that yields a lot of information and screens a large population to help diagnose a prevalent disease. And um, also the vaccine, it's the only cancer that has a vaccine that prevents it. And so we'll definitely delve into more details on these two things. So we'll start with the pap smear or pap test and then transition to HPV testing. So basically a hundred years ago, a man named Georges Papanicolaou um, developed the pap smear. He is considered the father of the pap smear. So another important name in GYN history. And so, and then it, moving on to 1983, we had the German Cancer Research Center that identified um, HPV in cervical tumors. And this helped pave the way to determining that there is now a link between HPV and cervix cancer. And then here in uh, New York at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, several epidemiologic studies confirmed this HPV link with these precancers um, seen on pap smears and then the progression to cervix cancer. So lots of research over these several years has proven to us this link and, and now we have ways to prevent it from progressing um, if the virus is there. Um, so really, you know, no one ever likes to go to the GYN. No one wants to go to the dentist. And so just a little um, humor here um, with a little meme. I'm really looking forward to my pap smear today, said no woman ever. And that's true. No one likes to go to the gynecologist, but we have to. Um, and you're in good company because most patients are not happy to be in our office. But what we do is valuable and the screening that we offer and the treatments we offer is life-saving. So what is HPV? So we'll kind of um, go a little bit deeper dive into HPV. So it's a double-stranded circular DNA with over a hundred strains. As I mentioned, it's sexually transmitted by both men and women through sexual intercourse and sexual contact. And again, as I mentioned, 80% of sexually active men and women will be infected by age 50. And so, like I, so as I said, there's hundreds of strains but we categorize them into high risk and low risk. And so here's just a laundry list of the different viruses, viral strains that we see. And with the most highly carcinogenic, meaning the most high risk for cancer being 16 and 18 at the top of the list. We have a set of others, but 16 and 18 are really the, not the two um, high risk players that we, we, we are able to test for now and identify on this HPV testing uh, to determine if that is the type of HPV that the patient is infected with. Um, 
HPV doesn't just cause cervix cancer. I just want to highlight here that it's in it, it is related to other cancers as listed here. Uh, and then it is also related to non-cancerous conditions such as anal genital warts and then a respiratory papillomatosis. <clears throat> but here you can see there are several cancers that it's involved in. And when you kind of tally up these numbers with incidence rates, it's about over 40,000 cancers a year that HPV causes. So it's a big deal and it's really um, something that we should pay attention to and keep in mind as it affects um, uh, our, our cancer risk. Uh, so this diagram here kind of gives us a timeline of what to expect if you have an HPV infection, if you have an abnormal pap smear. This is something that's a very slow growing and slow evolving process. Um, and so it, it's not something that it's cervix cancer is not a cancer that um, happens overnight. Um, and so with proper screening, um, pre-invasive lesions can be identified and can be treated. And so the pap smear is what we use to screen for these abnormal or precancer cells. Then HPV testing screens for the high-risk HPV, and then we do a diagnostic test as a such as a cervical biopsy. That biopsy may identify what's called cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, which is abbreviated as CIN, and this is a pre-malignant condition that is diagnosed by cervical biopsy and then can progress to cancer if not treated. And so this timeline here, you have the initial HPV infection, which most people can clear. The lower risk HPV or the less um, uh, carcinogenic ones, we can clear them or they can rest dormant in our body with robust immune systems. Um, and then we won't see any abnormal changes on our, on our pap smear. But with continued infection, then you can start seeing low-level abnormalities, this is called CIN1, which again, majority of those can be cleared. Then with continued, um, further continued infection, you can see moderate level or high-level precancer, CIN2 and 3, and then cervix cancer. Rarely will the low level go straight to cancer. As I mentioned, this is a, it's a slowly evolving process and it's progressional. Um, and so an example of somebody who could be diagnosed with cervix cancer is let's say they had an abnormal pap smear and it and their biopsy showed CIN two to three, but then they for whatever reason, one reason or another, couldn't follow up, didn't have an excisional procedure to clear those um, high level precancer cells, and then ten years, seven ten years later, went by and now they have cervix cancer. Uh, so that's really kind of what we're talking about here, and we're looking at who are the most high risk um, to develop this cancer. Treatment of these pre-invasive lesions I alluded to is an excisional procedure, which is either a LEAP, a loop electrocautery excisional procedure, or a or cold knife cone biopsy. Uh, these are often done by a general gynecologist or a GYN oncologist, um, and uh, this will clear those abnormal cells giving the cervix what I call, what I like to call a clean slate and allows um, healthy new growth of these cells. And then in addition to that, suppressing that HPV, working on the immune system to um, be robust and um, suppress that HPV virus so it doesn't then have an opportunity to infect those cells again. Prevention um, of this disease is, as I mentioned, with the vaccine. Um, with screening and the vaccine. And so screening will start at age 21. Um, An HPV vaccination is approved for men and women age nine to 45. And here is a table that gives the three different organizations that have the screening guidelines for HPV and pap smear testing versus pap smear alone versus H, um, HPV testing alone. Most common thing that's happening is pap smear with HPV testing um, starting at age 30 and ending at age 65. And the timetables for this and the ages as which you start and end can vary. I wanna stress that a lot here because um, you know some people will say, oh, I'm 65 and I don't need pap smears anymore. But we have to think about who is that 65 year old? Um, are you somebody who's never had pap smear before? Are you somebody who's in a monogamous relationship? I'm sorry, 65 who's never had abnormal pap smears before or an HPV positive test. Are you 65 in a monogamous relationship with no intentions to have a newfound sexual life um, and no risk for exposure to HPV? Then yes, screaming ends at 65. But if you have any history of abnormal pap smears or HPV positivity, then this is then you're somebody who may have prolonged screening beyond that. 
And so it's important to have these conversations with your providers to know your history so that you know which category you fall into. And then as far as the timelines, every three years, every five years, this is just a pap smear, um, not an exam. So an examination, when you go to the GYN for a pelvic exam or they place a speculum in your vagina to look at the cervix, it doesn't mean you're getting a pap smear. The pap smear is actually the brush that then collects the cells from the cervix. Um, that doesn't have to get done every year depending on your history, um, but a pelvic exam, annual well women exam should be done on an annual basis. And so just wanted to kind of highlight how we're doing here in the United States with screening. Overall rate is 81%, and the goal in 2020 was for 93%, so we're just under. And we have seen, unfortunately, a decline in screening over the years. Um, it was when they looked at stu uh, a study that looked at numbers from 2000 to 2015, we saw a 5.8% decline. More recent data now after COVID-19 is con showing continued decline in screening and treatment of precancer lesions. And then again, going back to the disparity, what are we seeing? These factors that are driving low screening rates uh, are going to be personal factors, limited or lack of education, distrust in the health system, fear, and structural issues as well. We have limited or lack of insurance, cost, transportation, you know, rural communities, getting time off work, all these social factors that will affect um, people from getting screened. Um, and uh, more recent study, um, uh, looked at you know reasons for why um, screening is not happening and one of the reasons that was given was that uh, people said they just didn't know that they were supposed to have screening and so that goes back to the educational component and really encourages doctors like myself to be more motivated to educate in any way we can and spread awareness because that's the only way that we can prevent disease. Um, other ways of um, improving screening and disparity, how can we prevent this? This kind of goes to, speaks to uh, outreach and community engagement and education. And so there's a nice study done in 2020 that looked at engaging community health workers to increase cancer screening. And um, this was published in the Journal of Preventative Medicine and their work is supported by the Community Preventative Services Task Force. And this paper um, showed that this technique or this um, engagement of community health workers is effective. Um, it is utilized globally in a lot of developing countries. This is how um, various communities will get the word out about screening, about getting testing, is engaging locals within the villages or the towns to help educate um, the masses. And then um, it, it's, it is becoming more common here in the United States. I think we need more of it. And the this, this study suggests that it can really be cost-effective, may generate net cost savings, and can promote health equity. And so obviously more research to be done on it, but really, um, a promising approach to expanding um, um, and increasing our screening rates. And so prevention, how do we improve prevention? It's really with the HPV vaccine. I've said it many times and I'm a huge proponent of it, huge advocate. Um, it's uh, right now the most current version of the vaccine prevents nine strains of HPV and I've listed them here. Six and 11 are the low risk that cause genital warts, but these can still be a nuisance and genital warts if untreated can evolve into uh, vulvar cancer, let's say as an example. Most of these are found on the vulva, which is the outer part um, of the um, reproductive tract. And so there is a risk for a vulvar cancer there. Um, the high risk types of HPV are 16, 18, which are the most uh, virulent. And then we have other, other strains listed here, all of which are covered by the HPV vaccine. And these account for 90% of cervix cancers. So it really makes sense. And to me, it's a no brainer. If you can prevent a disease with the vaccine, why not? And uh, just to emphasize the safety of this vaccine, several phase two and phase three studies have been conducted confirming it's effective, confirming it's safe. Um, safety monitoring is always ongoing. They're constantly checking um, and really no major adverse effects have been found. Rare side effects, I'll just highlight syncope and anaphylaxis, um, extremely rare. And to emphasize there's no associations with autism, autoimmune disorders or increased sexual promiscuity. So these, this has been studied and um, really it's a very low risk vaccine with common side effects being similar to all vaccines that we received today. A little cartoon for some humor. 
Um, so who gets the vaccine? Uh, we have um, uh, initially it was approved for girls and girls and women and boys and men age nine to 26. Um, and with that um, approval, 10 years after the vaccine was introduced, we saw HIV related infection decreased by 86% in our teenage population and by 71% in our early 20s population. And there was a 50% decrease in cervical precancers from 2008 to 2015. Then in 2018, very exciting, the FDA expanded the age coverage. So men and women up to age 45 now can get this vaccine. And this is really exciting because this now opens it up to more people who can benefit. And so keep in mind, somebody who's up to age 45 is likely exposed to that virus. Um, but this data did show that there was still a benefit. 88% um, reduction in persistent HPV infections, because again, HPV will persist a little longer in as we get older, because our immune system is unable to clear it or suppress it. And we saw the reduction in persistence of the infection and, and reduction in general warts and these pre-invasive lesions and also in cervix cancer. And they have assessed um, 13,000 men and women and that again, safety assessments are ongoing. And the, how does the vaccine, how is it given? It's a three dose series um, with a, over a course of six months. And uh, some data from the pediatric literature has suggested that a two dose schedule six months apart is reasonable for uh, our younger um, cohort. And uh, this is because there's a suggestion that there's better antibody response in this age range. How are we doing with vaccines? So here on this, um, here in the United States, um, not so great, uh, but hopefully with time we're getting better. And this is, um, um, this is data from 2017, uh, but when I looked at, um, I think the more recent um, maps are maybe 2020, it's essentially the same. With the purple being the highest percentage of vaccination, all in the Northeast, and then um, lowest rates in the gray. So it would be really great one day for this entire map to be all purple and then for the entire world to be purple. Um, to show that we are at our highest rate of vaccination. And then I'm certain we will see a marked decline in incidence of cervix cancer. Um, so for, for those who um, are unable to get vaccine, vaccinated or cannot, or for those who had the persistent HPV um, infections that then turned into a cervix cancer, we do have treatment. So here I want to show you this busy slide from the National Can Comprehensive Cancer Network that um, basically gives us our guidelines on how to treat and take care of our cervix cancer patients. We have several algorithms for each stage of disease, each histologic type of disease. And so we follow national guidelines to give the best care and treatment strategies for our patients. Uh, so if you are unfortunate to get diagnosed with this cancer, we do have treatment and cervix cancer in early stage is curable. And um, even in the locally advanced or advanced stage, we do have excellent um, treatment strategies uh, that have been proven to prolong disease-free intervals. Uh, so lots of lots of research is ongoing, more, more to be done and more can be done. Uh, but this is, um, um, it's, it is hopeful in that we do have treatment options. And so the workup starts, as I mentioned in the beginning, with lab tests, biopsies, <clears throat> um, imaging studies. And then once the cancer is diagnosed, the histologic or cell type is diagnosed, we then come up with strategies for the different stages of disease. And here at the top is our early stage disease, the stage one categories. And then we have our stage um, two, three, and four categories here. And um, the mainstay of treatment currently for early stage disease, um, again, can be a spectrum depending on the patient's desires. Um, early stage disease, the most definitive treatment is a simple hysterectomy to remove the entire uterus and cervix. There are cases where excisional procedure with a leap or a cone biopsy can remove the entire microinvasive cancer and preserve the uterus and part of the cervix for fertility, or even a surgery to just remove the cervix can be performed in an early stage disease so that the patient can go on to have childbearing um, for their own biologic child. Um, 
more advanced early stage um, will have to have radical hysterectomies with lymph node dissection. This is in cases where the disease is now more deeply invasive and with a higher risk for spread to surrounding tissue. Um, and this is where a radical hysterectomy comes in. And then of course, with deeper invasion and higher risk for expansion to surrounding tissue, there's higher risk for lymph node involvement. So then a lymph node dissection is performed. In the locally advanced disease where it is primarily localized in the pelvis and in lymph nodes, we offer curative intent chemotherapy and radiation. We use a drug called cisplatin that is a radiosensitizing drug. It helps basically make the cancer cells more sensitive to the radiation. And the curative part of this treatment is the internal brachytherapy. And so that is the portion of the radiation that is done intracavitary. We place a device into the cervix and the uterus and the radiation is basically targeted right to the source. And um, this is done after the external radiation that shrinks everything and then the internal treatment um, for the curative arm of the um, treatment strategy. And finally, for our, our um, stage four or widely metastatic disease, we do have what's called systemic chemotherapy regimens that are coupled with now targeted therapies and immunotherapy. We're seeing lots and lots of promise in this realm, lots of research is ongoing, supporting the use of targeted therapies that target blood vessels of the cancer. That's the medication called bevacizumab and immunotherapy that targets um, various mutations that um, can um, um, help the immune system uh, create a robust um, um, treatment effect against the cancer. Uh, so really, again, lots of hope and lots of um, treatment options for our patients with cervix cancer. So I want to leave you all with some take home points here. Um, cervical cancer is preventable. So please do not miss your annual GYN visits, annual visits with your gynecologist. Um, Effective screening with pap smear pap test and the HPV test is what helps us prevent this disease. And of course the HPV vaccine is a key prevention strategy. Um, disparity in care is real and it is what drives low screening and low vaccination rates. So um, obviously the why and the how is constantly being researched today. Um, lots of work being done on this to help uh, improve health equity and minimize this disparity. And then finally, this is a treatable cancer. We have surgical options, we have chemotherapy, radiation, and also immunotherapy. So it is the treatment options are expansive. And again, uh, we are able to cure uh, patients with early stage disease. Um, I will now open up to questions if we have any. I think there's some in the chat and I'm sure Aisha can maybe help moderate that part of the talk. And I thank you all for your attention and I hope you enjoyed the talk and learned something new. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, let's start the Q&A. Uh, you can still submit questions through the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. We will try to get through as many of the submitted questions as we can, but we might not be able to due to time constraints. Uh, so the first one we have is, how do you treat precancerous abnormalities of the cervix? What about CIN, uh, CIN3 specifically? Okay, so um, I, had, I did have a slide on that and um, I know just briefly discussed it, but so CIN3, so that's cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. So that's level three. Um, so this is the highest risk precancer that we have. So when we talk about that progressive process, we have, and anytime I talk with my patients about this, I draw a little diagram and I draw a progressive chart that says CIN1, two, three, cancer. So this is the one that left untreated has the highest risk for progression. Treatment of this um, is most always an excisional procedure. CIN3, you're un he has a lower chance of clearing it. So anytime it is seen, we want to excise the area for treatment and then also for diagnosis because cancer can live concurrently with that CIN3 in about five to 10%. 
And so it is important to remove that abnormal tissue to prove that there's no cancer living with it. Or if there is cancer, we have now diagnosed it and also then removed it. And so it is an excisional procedure, either a leap um, or the cold knife cone biopsy with what's called an endocervical curatage. And so that's a scraping of the lining of the cervix that we do after we excise that abnormal tissue. Because again, with the cervix, what we're seeing when we're examining you is this kind of the face of the cervix, what's called the ectocervix. The cervix is a long canal. So it has an internal part called an endocervix. And that's not going to be captured uh, sufficiently with just that excision. We'll get part of it. But that endocervical scraping after that excision will help us capture that inner lining to make sure we're not missing anything higher up or beyond our excision. Oh. Okay. Um, how can I advocate for myself better in the healthcare system? That's a great question. And I think it's important. It kind of goes in line with a lot of what we talked about here with disparity and access. Um, I think. Um, you know, asking as many questions as you can and asking important questions or, you know, going to, uh, you know, and, the, and some, then the next thing is what questions should I ask or what are important questions, right? And I think um, Share, for example, provides great resources on their, um, on their website, on Instagram. And there's other reputable um, support groups and other um, organizations that provide curated information by, by doctors in the field, by oncologists like myself. And so you can find valuable and good information and those will give you resources and um, the tools that you need to come to the office with questions um, so that you can better advocate for yourself and get the answers that you need. Awesome. Um, do you recommend getting the HPV vaccine if you've already had cervical cancer? Uh, so that, so the, there's, Really, the data out there is, um, I think, still evolving. What I can say is there is data that supports the vaccine after, let's say, you've had a pre-invasive lesion. So you've had a CIN3 and, and you went for a leap. There is actually a very nice study that came out not too long ago that says um, excise, after that excision, giving the vaccine series helps decrease that chance of that um, pre-invasive lesion recurring. Mm -hmm. um, so it definitely is beneficial in that setting. As far as once you've already had cervix cancer, you know, there were actually some studies and I think there's the, the data is still cooking or evolving um, on actually treating with the vaccine. And so we, it's still to be determined. I think right now it's in a preventative state and geared towards um, people who have never been exposed, our young, our children, and then in the um, age groups up to 45 uh, that either that maybe have persistent HPV um, or persistent pre-invasive lesions. Gotcha. Um, should I continue to get cervical cancer screening if I've had the HPV vaccine? The answer is yes. Um, the vaccine doesn't say you don't need the screening, it now may help you pro, you know, prolong the time between your screening, right? So you got the vaccine, you, you don't have your um, clear of HPV, your pap smears are normal, now you can space out to every three years or every five years. Um, you know, but the, again, remember the vaccine only targets nine strains, there are hundreds of strains of HPV, you may be protected from those high risk um, nine, but there's others that you could be exposed to over time. So I would say, yes, you should continue your cervical cancer screening. Okay. Um, what is the difference between the PAP test and the HPV test? Is one better than the other? So the PAP test collects actual cells from the cervix and they takes those cells and looks under a microscope. The HP, and then that will tell us what those cells look like. Are those cells normal cervix cells? Are they low grade abnormal? Are they mildly atypical? Are they high grade abnormal? And then the, HP, the HPV test actually picks up the viral DNA. It looks at, is the virus there? And then we can type, we can test for what type of HPV, right? We can look at, is it 18 or 16? That's, those are the two that we're testing for right now. So they're different in that one is looking at the cells under a microscope and this the other one is looking at actual viral DNA. Um, 
there is evolving data and studies that are looking at maybe stopping the cytology and not really weighing as much heavily on that, but really just looking at HPV, the HPV test, and really focusing on 16 and 18 as the main culprits. You know, um, the ASCCP, which is um, a national organization looking at, uh, that gives us a lot of our guidelines for cervix cancer screening and prevention, um, talks about this um, risk stratification now. You know, somebody who um, maybe has low grade pap smears like forever and ever and ever, but then what's that HPV doing? Let's like, let's target or hone in on that HPV. Is the HPV a high risk type? Is it persistent or is it negative? That's now becoming more of the attention because as we're stratifying patients and looking at risk assessment, we're finding that it's not those low grade cells that are gonna eventually be a problem. It's if that HPV 16 or 18 is still active and still shedding. And so over time, we may evolve to uh, testing where it's just the HPV testing alone, but we're not there yet. So we still do a combination. Okay. Um, why are the mortality rates for cervical cancer higher among black, black women? That's a loaded question and I don't think I can answer it <laughs> on this talk or, it, or you know, get come up with all the reasons why, but I think it's, um, um, if you just kind of think about um, the factors that I mentioned that um, contribute to disparity, you think about where our um, majority of our black population is in this country, you think about the socioeconomic divides, um, there's so many factors. And then you think about systemic racism, you think about all these um, topics that have come up over the past three years um, that are bringing light to this. And um, there's, it's, so, it's multifactorial and there's um, um, lots and lots more to be done on this topic. And I, I wish I could sit here and deliberate that all day, but um, um, you know, it, it's, I think a lot of the factors that I mentioned in the talk are contributors and ways in which to improve those is what's gonna help us um, decrease the mortality rates. Okay. Well, with that being said, what can we do to combat cervical cancer disparities? I think, uh, you know, one of my, what I think is um, uh, a great way to do it is the, as a, one of those studies that I highlighted, it looks at the community health workers. I think really getting into the communities and talking the same language, walking the same walk as um, our, our, pop, our various populations, I think will help. A lot of times um, studies that look at patient experiences, you know, they like to see a doctor that looks like them or a doctor that speaks their language, you know, and may, you know, expanding or improving the diversity of our health community, um, I think will, is definitely a way to reach more people. I think, um, uh, historically, lots of fear um, with our disadvantaged populations, with our Black populations, Hispanic. And so getting to that doctor or the worry about how they'll be treated, it limits the access, right? And so I think changing the, changing the dialogue, changing the, the uh, dynamics of our field will help. And I mean, it's obviously it's longitudinal, right? But I think... Um, Community reach, I feel like that's a huge way we can do it. I think if you have people in the community doing the work there and then bringing people to doctors like me <laughs> um, and others who are passionate and want to decrease disparity, I think um, is, is kind of just the, you know, is a starting point. Yeah. Can cervical cancer run in families? Uh, so the most, um, Common types of cervix cancer that we see um, are not a hereditary um, condition. Um, there are very, very rare types that can be linked to um, hereditary syndromes, but the short answer is unlikely. It is an HPV driven disease and it's not a hereditary disease. Okay. If you have the HPV that leads to cervical cancer, will you always have HPV? Um, so <clears throat> the high risk types that lead to cervix cancer are the types that persist more. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of like to think about viruses are all viruses, the common cold, 
COVID, any, any of these viruses, they become kind of part of your DNA, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, some of them, our body is really good at clearing and can get rid of it, but whatever we can't, then our body kind of puts it in a dormant state and suppresses it. And that's really, I think, when I think about HBV and I think about this virus, you know, it's, it's great if we can clear it and you've had several um, HBV tests year after year that are negative, that's likely confirms you've cleared it and it's not ever coming back. Um, but um, in the, again, in the older population who are, our immune system may not be as robust enough to clear this, we're at least right. suppressing it. We're suppressing it. We're suppressing it from acting out, from shedding, from attacking these vulnerable cell populations on the cervix. <clears throat> okay. Um, what can we do to address the stigma associated with HPV? Stop the stigma. <laughs> right? <laughs> Stop, you know, I think it's the stigma associated with sex and not yeah. wanting to talk about it and, you know, exactly. not to our kids about it and shushing and, oh, we don't talk mm -hmm. about parts or, you know, I think that's, that's how we get rid of it is maybe we need to talk more about it. We need to say that every, you know, I think, um, I didn't, I, in some of these talks, I, I put on, um, uh, one of the comedians, um, um, Ali, Ali Wong, I think her name is, she um, mm -hmm. does a, a skit on HPV, like literally oh, yeah. she talks about. And in one of her, one of the clips, she says, she's like, everybody's, everybody's going to get it. Everybody's yeah. going to get it. And she was like, and if you don't have it, you're going to get it. Like, you're, mm -hmm. it's coming, it's coming, you're going to get it. So yeah. we just have to normalize it. We have to say, mm -hmm. look, this is something my, I have three boys and I promise you, they will, as soon as they're old enough, they will each get their HPV vaccine. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. They're going to be exposed. And if I can do something to prevent um, them from spreading this or even getting some kind of cancer of their own, why sure. not? You know, I think sure. it's, we just need to talk more about it and it's not taboo. It's, yes. this is life and it's reality and you know, do what we can to protect ourselves. Mm -hmm. What common risks, what are like the most common risk factors you've seen associated with, to, with cervical cancer? So smoking, I'll say is like number one on the list. Smoking, mm -hmm. smoking, smoking, you know, I think, um, um, and then just, you know, the, the patients that, or the people that just stop going to the doctor, you know, I think, um, you have, um, the woman that comes in, diagnosed with advanced cervix cancer. When was the last time you saw a doctor? Oh, after my last child was born. Mm. And, and that's, that was maybe 20 years ago, you know, right. when they stopped going to the GYN, they didn't have to go anymore. They didn't need to. So I, I would say it's um, smoking for sure. Um, and really the access, lack of access to care, you know, the follow-up really kind of a loss in follow-up. Gotcha. Um, how can we make screening more accessible to everyone? Um, so I think here in, I mean, it's, here in the United States, it's very well established and we have the resources and it's accessible. I think it's getting the people to the sites, you know, having right. more clinics that take all the various insurance, you know, not limiting patients by insurance or, um, uh, you know, I think there's some, some, some talks about well, mobile clinics or pop-up, um, GYN mobile, um, pap smear testing sites, things like that. I think, um, um, it's really informing the masses, educating the masses. Yes, you need screening. Talk to your primary care doctor about it. You know, I think we, we do a good job at least of talking about colon cancer screening or even more importantly, breast cancer screening, right? Everybody knows about mammograms. Everybody's talking about mammograms, you know, but, you know, is, is a PCP also asking you about cervix cancer screening? Like when was the last time you saw your GYN? So I think it's, it's our job within our medical system to, um, for our primary care providers, the people who are at the front line of taking care of patients to have those conversations, to ask those questions and then refer them to the general GYN. Mm -hmm. Not everybody has to come to a gynecologic oncologist like me. You have to go to a general GYN and, then of course you'll be sent to me if you need, but it's the primary care doctors. They're the ones who really are at the front line that um, need to be asking these questions. And then of course, um, engage in the community on various levels, I think. Absolutely. Um, how can people over the age of 26 potentially get the HPV vaccine for free or at a reduced 
price or do you have any idea about that? Yeah, I, I don't, but I do know that it's, I was actually having a conversation with a, with a male colleague um, who was, he said he was searching high and low for the vaccine. It was very hard for him to get, and he finally found like a pharmacy, some random pharmacy that offered it. Um, so yeah, so it, it can be a challenge, I think, starting with the primary care, starting with your OBGYN. Um, you know, I think um, most insurance will cover it because it's up to age 45. You don't have to have... Mm -hmm. A, you know, pre-cancerous lesion, you can just say, I want the vaccine, um, mm -hmm. but it's insurance dependent, which is unfortunately uh, can be a challenge. Right. Um, you mentioned in one of your slides that the, the warts may not be HPV related. Could you explain and can you clear HPV but still have the warts? Uh, so I think I mentioned that warts are HPV related. There's general okay. or HPV 6 and 11 are the mm -hmm. two types of HPV that can cause the general warts. Those are low risk type. Those are usually not associated with cancer. Um, there are some um, that can be driven by the higher risk type that then persist and over time can transform. Uh, mm -hmm. But clearing a, a, a wart, um, uh, usually cryotherapy or excising it, um, topical creams, those usually eradicate them and they're, that's kind of the end of them if they haven't had any kind of malignant transformation. Okay, okay. Well, uh, this has been a super informative program. I really appreciate you coming today. Um, and thank you all for participating and sending questions. Mm -hmm. uh, please make sure to check out our upcoming educa educational programs and support groups and follow us on social media as well. Uh, please take a moment to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. The survey will show up in the browser when the webinar ends, and the link will also be in the follow-up email. All surveys are anonymous. This concludes the webinar. Thank you so much, and thank you, Dr. David West, especially. Thank you, Aisha, and thank you all for participating. It was very enjoyable for me, too. Perfect. Bye. Bye.